I want you today, or this morning, or wherever you are, I want you to to share it, to like this page, and to share it as, with as many people as possible. And I have a very serious conversation that I'm going to have with you. And serious does not mean it's going to be a sad conversation, it just means a conversation that will be focused on some things that people might think about. I put out a video about the fact that I am hospitalized and, and today, today is a major day. This is a day that I have my procedure. Now I want to just, just starting out one, I want you to pray for my two sons, Calvin, my oldest son. He's in Jacksonville. He's facing a health challenge. Pray that he will have a full recovery. My son, John Leslie, he's in LA. Pray that he will have a full recovery and be able to commit himself to getting all the help that he can come in for himself so that he can live a normal life uh, being bipolar. And I want you to also pray. Did you need me? Oh, you just coming in. Thank you. I want you to pray that today at 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time that you... Thank you so much. Yeah, you know I love your little hat, Monica, Monica Grieve, my very good friend here, my little spiritual daughter here at Cleveland just brought me some little earplugs for a fault. I want you to pray that the doctor's hands are, are directed by God and, and that their level of wisdom and knowledge beyond their university degrees and all of their training will come into play as they perform the procedure on me. And I wanted to, I want you to like this page and to, to share it with as many people as possible. Something came to me this morning that I'd like to share with you. And the title of this conversation is, what do you do when your prayers are not answered? What do you do? How do you deal with that? Have you ever prayed for something and it did not happen? Well, you know, I have been a, a 21 year cancer conqueror. So I said, because seven is my lucky number, anybody who knows me know that. I'm one of seven children. I was born February the 17th. Seven is my lucky number. And three times seven is 21. So my prayer has been, this is the year. Every year I would pray, this is the year that I will be free of cancer. And so something happened. Not only did that not happen in 2017, which I felt that it was going to happen, but in addition to that not happening, and at that time when I started the prayer, the prayer by the, my uh, doctor said, the oncologist said that cancer had metastasized to my T1 vertebrae and six other different areas, and that it had eroded 40% of my T1 vertebrae. So my prayer was, Lord, restore my T1 vertebrae and, and allow me to be free of cancer. Well, in the last week or so, I started, right before the end of the year, started experiencing deep pain in my body. And I said, wow, and I was in and out of the hospital. I said, what's going on? And so I was misdiagnosed. They thought it was sciatica pain was not the pain from sciatica, pain from the cancer. Not only did it, it not, did God not remove the cancer from my T1 vertebrae, but it spread to, the doctor said, the day before yesterday, it said, it said that number one, number two, number three vertebrae. It spread to those, and in addition to at 7C. Now, first of all, I got excited. Number one, number two, and number three, the cancer spread to those and to the seven C. Well, now, seven is my lucky number. It skipped four and five. Seven is my lucky number. Now, what does the C stand for? Commitment. Commitment. What do you do when your prayer is unanswered? Maintain your commitment of faith. Maintain your commitment to, com to continue to work, to believe, to hold the vision of what it is you want to achieve. 
it, it's the, what a lot of people do is they give up because it doesn't happen. And I had to say to myself, wait a minute, I, I wanted this to happen, but come on, God, you know, at what time I want to say, whose side are you on? <laughs> What? This, is, this is not what I asked for. I said, remove this cancer from my T1 vertebrae. Hello? And would you think that I wouldn't want it to be moved to my second or third in case I wasn't exactly clear and my seventh, uh, seventh area of my back, okay? I mean, hello? <laughs> No, 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 I, I was not going to push you out on that, but I would say, come on, I thought I was very clear what language you want this in, but seriously, what I pray for just the opposite happened. Now, I think that people who are religious, they give up because, you know, religious people are afraid of going to hell. Well, spiritual people, we've been there, <laughs> okay, so we're used to this. So they took me down yesterday. You can't see this. So they they mapped my body, and this is this this area where they mapped it with this permanent dye to get ready for the procedure today. So they go in today, and I at two o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Now I believe in the power of collective prayer, so I'm asking you that you pray. That my primary concern was coming out with my voice. Is that I said, will I still be able to speak? And is it probably? Is it probably did you say probably? <laughs> I ask her as if I, but speaking gives me life, you know. So, so I said, well, your throat will be sore for a few days. So they walked me here, and and they did something what is called mapping. And then I so at two o'clock Eastern Standard Time, I go in for the procedure, and it's in the spinal area where they said the cancer is metastasized. And you know, anytime you're dealing with the spine, you could you could be a quadriplegic, you could lose your voice, you could lose your life, anything can happen. But I said, just in case that this might be my last day, I'm not gonna take it for granted. I said, well, I'll talk to them after the 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 procedure. But then I said, wait a minute. I haven't gotten any special notice <laughs> you know, that, that, that I will still be here after that. I'm not going to take it for granted. So I said, I'm going to take care of this opportunity in the event that this is the last time you hear my voice alive or if this, this is the last time that I am to speak to you and connect with you, I want to speak now. And so my prayer is that my two sons have a full recovery and be able to live a normal life. And my prayer is that today, that I'm able to come out of this alive and have my voice and continue to be able to work, even if I'm a quadriplegic. If I have my voice, I can still speak. And even if I can't speak, I can still write. And even if I can't write, I can still see and I can still hear, so there's something I can do, there's a way in which I can still be used. And, and so my prayer is that, Father, I know that you're with me, and that whatever happens today, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. Life does not owe me anything. When I think about my life, born in an abandoned building on a floor in Liberty City in Miami, being adopted, by the incredible Mamie Brown. God took me out of my biological mother's womb and placed me in the heart of my adopted mother. I'm talking to you because of two women. One gave me life, the other one gave me love. All that I am and all that I ever hope to be, I owe to my mother. But I think about the sacrifices and the tough times that she faced raising seven children she didn't give birth to by herself, except for the help of God and some people who said, Mamie, what can I do to help you out with those seven kids? And there were many. And to be blessed with a man who spoke and interrupted the vision that I had of myself when I was on the wrong track in life, Mr. Leroy Washington. And when I was labeled educable mentally retarded in the fifth grade and put back in the fourth grade and fell again in the eighth grade. And my junior year in high school, God made it fit that I 
would meet this man and he challenged me to work out a problem. I said, I'm not here. I'm not one of your students. I'm here to see MacArthur Stevens. He said, do what I'm asking you to do anyhow. And the kids started laughing. He's Leslie. He's got twin brother Wesley. Wesley's smart. He's DT. What's DT? He's a dumb twin. And I said, I am, sir. And looking down, he said, look at me. Don't ever say that again. Someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. That was a defining moment in my life. We all have defining moments, defining moments, a moment that something happened and who you were before that moment, after that moment, because of what you experienced, because of what was said to you after that moment, because of what you have grown through, your life was never the same again. And my life was never the same again. And I became convicted in my spirit that I wanted to be to people what Mr. Washington was to me. He interrupted my story I believed about myself that had been given to me by the world. And we're taught, be ye not conformed to this world. Don't be like everybody else. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What do you do less when your prayers aren't answered? Keep the faith and keep on working. Keep the faith and keep on working anyway, in spite of, in spite of. Here's the thing that as you look at yourself and look at your goals, the things happen many times when they happen. So be it. But don't lose faith. I remember Adam Clayton Powell out of, out of New York. He was a congressman. He was a bad boy. He had a classic speech called, Keep the Faith, Baby. Keep the Faith. And, and that's real. I remember Jesse used to say, if you keep on hoping, you can keep on hopping. <laughs> That's real. That's real. I'll be hopping down to the operating room today. Uh, the other thing is that it is very important that you saturate your mind with positive things. I got up this morning. I was listening to myself like I was a perfect stranger because I was a different person then. And when I was speaking then, the things that I was going through was nothing compared to what I'm facing now. And so I spoke from a different place of energy. I was in good health. I was, I had my six pack kit, <laughs> which I got a one pack covered up by six pack right now. Every time the nurse would come in to, to stick some pins in my stomach, some needles in my stomach, I said, this used to be a six pack. They're covered up temporarily right now. Can you feel the brother up in here, up in here? They got all these different instruments and things connected to me. And, and so when things happen to you, Sometimes you wonder, God, where are you? Are you here? Give me a sign. And I was asking for signs and get that for me. And I, I, I didn't I didn't get the sign that I want. Instead of, of instead of cancer being um, eliminated, it spread. And so I was talking to a friend of mine named named Grayson, and I said, Grayson, he called me in Jacksonville. He's, he's one of my spiritual sons. And I said, I'm, I'm in the hospital in, in Cleveland, and, and I'm having a procedure today. You know, they're going to my spinal area, and I'm concerned about my voice, and, and I want your prayer to be that, that I maintain my voice, and I'm able to, to walk out of here, and to be able to continue to do my work. And I said, my prayer was for God to eliminate the year t of 2017, because 2017 and 7 is my lucky number. 3 times 7 is 21. This is my 21st year dealing with cancer. To eliminate the, the cancer. And, and I said, instead, it moved from my T1 vertebrae to my 2 vertebrae and a 3, and then to the 7C. And he said, Les, the cancer spread so it can get out. I said, oh, come on now. Flesh and blood did reveal that to you, but my heavenly Father, which art in heaven. Now, you all know something serious. I'm going to get some kind of procedure. I'm letting you all see this little gray rod here. You know, homie don't be playing that. I, I, I couldn't find my mascara this morning. Isn't that something crazy? So, <laughs> let me they pat this stuff down. I can't believe it. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Please help me. They're having a revolution. The gray hair say, come on, let's come out now. He's doing a Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> so, seriously, as you, as you look at yourself, sometimes the prayers can be answered, but in a different way. And, and to me, 
this is an opportunity, a defining moment. It's a defining moment it, that, that sometimes life will test you. You know, it's easy to have faith when you get the prognosis you want from a doctor. It's easy to have faith when your bills are paid. I remember when, when my, the home that I purchased for my mother went into foreclosure because I, I didn't do a title search when I purchased a home. And I remember when we got the letter saying that the sheriff will be coming out to set our furniture out if we had not moved out. And I didn't, I didn't lift a finger to move anything. I was praying. And I called the, the previous owner. I said, can you give me this three months, sir? I was ripped off. I didn't know. I was naive. I said, would you please, would you please give me a break? Close that door. Is that door closed? Mm -hmm. Okay. Would you please give me time, some monthly payments? He said, no, I want you out. And he, he, and he they went to the sheriff and, and won a judgment to foreclosure. And I remember praying. I remember praying. And finally, I said, how do I tell my mother this home that is the fulfillment of a dream that, that we have to move? It's going into foreclosure. And I, around 2.30, I went downstairs and, and I, I kneeled by the bed and I said, Mama, she said, yes. So I said, said you awake? She said, yes. She said, how can I sleep? I can hear you walking back and forth upstairs. I said, well, there's something I need to tell you. You know, and I've been praying to God to give me a sign that the home would not be foreclosed on, that the sheriffs would not be coming out. And I said, Mama, I said, we're going to have to move. The house is going to, into foreclosure. And, and she said, Leslie? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, I know you bought this house for me to say thank you for adopting you and your brothers and sisters, but you didn't have to do this. I said, I know, Mama. And you didn't have to adopt us either. And so I said, well, they're going to come. And I've been praying to God that somehow this would work out. But we're going to have to move today. And she said, fine with me. I like this house anyway. I said, come on, Mama, you said you loved it. She said, I loved it because you loved it. Leslie, she said, going up and down these steps, it's bad on my knees, and and as a result, that it, it hurts my knees. It's an arthritic condition that I have, but I, I wouldn't tell you. And so, the thing is that I said, okay, yes, ma'am. She said, we'll be all right. Here's what I want you to know: even if your prayers are not answered exactly like you want them to be answered. Take some wisdom from my mother, Mamie Brown. You'll be all right. You'll be all right. Even though I might come out and, and not be able to walk or talk, but if I got my life, I'll be all right. Even if you're facing all types of adverse circumstances, financial bankruptcy, divorce, being laid off from a job, uh, being challenged with a physical illness, not having the money and resources that you need right now, to come through this, just be con convicted in your spirit. You'll be all right, in spite of judge not according to appearances. But righteous judgment, call forth those things that be not, as though they were. Here's something else. When we loaded the truck and we were driving back to Liberty City, we were living in North Miami Beach, where I bought, my, bought this, my, this home for my mother. And that's a very fascinating story. And. And the neighbors came out looking. Mamie, yes. You're back, yes. What happened to the home that Leslie bought for you? He didn't do a title search. And there's a large bill that had to be paid in order to keep the house and he didn't have the money. And so we had to get out. I remember that day as if it were yesterday when the the sheriff authorities knocked on the door. I was holding the Bible and he said, you Les Brown? I said, yes. He said, sir, you, your house is under foreclosure. You have to leave today. So I said, holding the Bible and the Holy Quran, I must admit. I said, I'm standing on his words. And he said, no problem. Just step outside the door, stand out here on the sidewalk. <laughs> I 
rain all night. My eyes are red. I know. I look like the creature from the Black Lagoon. <laughs> you know, I know my breath. My breath had to be kicking like Bruce Lee. I was up all night praying to Jesus, to Yahweh, to Allah. I was calling on the whole gang. <laughs> It's amazing how spiritual you become and diverse. You become when you when you're in a tight situation, you know. So, so they, uh, I got Mama up, and they sent people in to to remove the furniture, add insult to injury. Neighbors, people that I thought would look out for me, they took a lot of our stuff. But here's. Here's the part that I want you to remember. What do you do when your prayers are not answered? I pray to God, don't let me lose this house that I've bought for my mother, who worked on Miami Beach for wealthy families, who cooked for them. And we ate the food left over from the families that she cooked for. She kept their children, and we wore the hand-me-down clothes of the children that she kept. And she adopted us, and she promised our Birth mother, I never let them go to bed hungry. There will always be food on the table, clothes on their back, and always a roof over their head. And she kept that commitment, and I wanted to do that for her. Please, God, don't let this happen to me. And it happened. And as I was unloading the truck, I remember feeling humiliated, stupid, and dumb, depressed. And I remember my mother coming to the back of the truck. And she said, boy, I said, yes, ma'am. She said, hold your head up. Hold your head up. I said, mama, I let you down. I'm so sorry. This is the worst day of my life. I'm so sorry. She said, hold your head up. Take that furniture off that truck and bring it in the house. She said, we still have each other. Whew. Hold your head up. We still have each other. She didn't have an ounce of disappointment in me. It wasn't about the house, it was about me. She knew my heart that I just made a mistake. It was the first major purchase I'd made. I remember during the negotiations that my attorney asked the, the guy that was selling me the house, do you have any liens against the property? He said, no. So she said, well, I think we should do a title search. So I asked the guy, so do you have any liens against the property? He said, and he was good, he said, the only reason I'm selling you this house is because I admire your love for your mother. No, I have no liens against it. And I don't have to sell you this house. I got other people ready to buy it. Now, I sold it to you at a lower price, and I had it listed on the market. So if you're you not willing to sign the contract now, then the deal is off. I looked at my attorney, and I said, pass me the contract. I believe him. And she just dropped her head. She said... I highly recommend you don't do this, Mr. Brown. I said, I'm, I'm going to do it on faith. And the Bible says, watch as well as pray. And I, I should have watched. I should not have gone against the legal advice. I should have followed what my attorney told me. And, and because I, I went through that experience, get her back for me, please. Uh, the house went into foreclosure shortly thereafter. But two things uh, that was defining. One, you're going to be all right. And that's real. You're going to be all right. Take my word for it. You are going to be all right. And you must know that even though you have no proof to point to, that you're going to be all right because he'll never leave you nor forsake you. And keep your head up. Keep your head up. And so as I get ready for this procedure today, I'm keeping my head up. I'm believing 
that when they go in with the radiation to reduce the tumors and to minimize the impact of the cancer, that I'll be out of pain, I'll be able to walk out of here, and I'll, I'll continue to hold on to the words of Willie Jolly, who said, a setback is a setup for a comeback. And I believe today is a setup. There are a lot of speakers who don't want me to make it. You know, everybody, everybody don't want you to make it, you know. There's some people don't want to see you to make it because that will be more speaking engagements for them. The speakers bureaus will stop calling me because people call them and say, Les Brown is dying. Well, my dying has been overrated. <laughs> We're all going to go. Every, all of us are dying daily, okay? But I've been dying daily to who I was to become who I am now, and I'm still being reborn. So let me see what my daughter, get her on the phone, please call her so I can talk to her. Yeah. I want to answer your phone. You're going to leave a message for me to call you, and, and, and you want me to stop so I can talk to you. My, my knucklehead daughter with a pumpkin head look like me without a beard calling me while I'm talking during the broadcast. So, answer your phone, Monica's calling you back on it for me. So, this is a prompt-to conversation that the thing's going to happen. And they say, we have not because we ask not. No, I did ask over and over and over again for 21 years. Lord, I claim to be free of cancer. By your grace, I'm healed. And it hasn't happened yet. What do you do when your prayer is not answered? Keep the faith. Honor your commitment. Therefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. What is that armor? Patience. Persistence in spite of. Perseverance in spite of. Being unstoppable in spite of. Being true to your values in spite of. Standing on principles in spite of. That's what you do. Don't decide to become a wimp and back off, say, well, I prayed and it didn't happen. No. You're still here. You're still breathing. Everybody can't say that. There, there's something that you are supposed to do. And so when you, yes, what is she saying? Hey, well, my daughter, you know, children. Yes. Tell her. Oh, my sister, <laughs> my sister Robert Ann just texted my daughter Oda to tell your father to stop the broadcast because he looks old and he looks sickly. Oh, my, <laughs> my grand, <laughs> my sister, I look old because I'm done the little gray show and I'm ugly. Oh, oh my God, you don't have to call me ugly. <laughs> My sister Margaret Ann Sampson, she keeps it real. Margaret Ann, the reason I'm doing it like this, everybody's seen me in my red tie and my white shirt and navy blue pants and suit, but hey, I want to, I want people to see me raw and say they, they don't like me because of my gray hair and they won't see it after the day and because I'm ugly. And that's okay. <laughs> I got a face that only a mother could love. <laughs> I can't believe you said this. Stop this broadcast right now. I am not. My nephew, Alex Sampson Jr., he can hook me up. And, I, you know, that bring out the Barry White in me or the Denzel in me. Okay. But I'm, I, the, but the point, point that I'm making, it's easy. When you have money in the bank, it's easy when you have your health, it's easy when your marriage is working out and your children are acting like they have good sense and, and they have not been picked up by aliens and you look at them and say, this can't be my child. This is something from outer space. This is not what I brought home from the hospital. <laughs> I believe in aliens, okay? But, the, but I, I wanted to share this time with you and if you can hear me in your heart, you don't care what I look like right now. You really don't. Because what I'm saying resonates with you. What I'm saying has some meaning. This is not for everybody. This is not for everybody. 
And so I'm not about looking good, but I want it before going down, before they sedate me, before I go through this procedure. If I don't get out of this procedure, if I don't come out, it's okay. I, I, I was asked a question. If you, if you knew that you were going to go now, and then you were given an extra chance, what would you do with your life? You know what I would do? If I knew I was leaving today and they said, but we're going to give you some more time, what would you, how would you spend that time? I'd spend that time doing work with my family, enjoying special moments with them, and speaking. That's what I'll do. I'll, I'll speak and talk. I told my kids, when they say I'm gone, do not allow them to embalm me for three days. Come down there to the, to the morgue and, and put a microphone in my hand. And if I don't grab it and set up and say, you got to be hungry, you can look around and say to each other, dad's gone now. <laughs> He's gone because I was born to speak. I was born to help people. I am who I am because somebody's spoken to my life. I am who I am because of Mike Williams. I want you to get his book, The Road to Your Best Stuff. He led me to my best stuff. He's my mentor to this day. Mike Williams, I wish you could tell you I did it all myself. No, he's a strategist, extraordinaire. And he saw me at WVKO radio station in Columbus, Ohio. And he said, hey, Brownie, you know you're more than a disc jockey. Hey, Brownie, you know why you go see Dr. Norman Vincent Peale and Tony Robbins and, and Zig Ziglar and all those guys? I said, why? Because I like their message. No, because it's in you. At that time, I was LB, Triple P, Lush Brown, your platter, plan, papa. There were none before me, there will be none after me. Therefore, that makes me the one and only young and single and love to mingle. Hey, that guy's gone. Bam! I was bad when I did it. The whole homie was bad. Let the record show. And between records, this guy talked to me. That, that's, that's the third thing I want to talk to you about. The power of your willingness to listen to a powerful positive word from someone who can see in you that which you cannot see in yourself. Someone that has trained eye and accomplishment. And I loved him because I was one of his groupies. I admired the way he spoke. I admired how he held himself. And most importantly, he was the message that he brought. And I admired that. He's a person of integrity. Mike Williams, he's the only father that I've ever known other than my mother because Father's Day came. I gave Mamie Brown a Father's Day because she was my mother and my father. And only two years difference between Mike Williams and I. He's still in Columbus. But he saw this last Brown because I, because I was open to listen to him and to be coachable. You can't read the label when you're locked in the box. And he saw this, Les Brown. He said, Brownie, I see things, and I see you doing more than just editorials on WVKO. I see you doing more than just spending records in the morning, that you can impact people's lives around the world. He and, and, and former state senator um, Ray Miller, who took my place in the Ohio legislature, the, you, these people, having people in your life who can see Another you that you can't see right now. And it took him 14 years, I'm embarrassed to say, to convince me. Because I didn't think that this Les Brown existed. I didn't think I can compete with people with PhDs and MBAs. I didn't think that I could be who I am now and live the life that I've lived, changing millions of people's lives around the world and speaking over 51 different countries. I did not think that someone would pay me for any. There are things that you can do. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has entered the heart of mankind what God has in store for you. So as I get ready for them to come and wheel me down for this procedure and, and sedate me and, and perform this procedure, I ask your prayers at 2 o'clock Eastern time that, that God give them the wisdom and the accuracy to do what they need to do above and beyond what they've been trained in the universities and and doctoral programs that come out with my voice and my ability to continue to speak and to serve. I will give you a call as soon as the anesthesia wears off. I will, I'd like for you to spread this out. I want you to watch this and, and share it with as many people. I think people need to know, what do you do when your prayers are not answered? One, you keep the faith. Two, you keep on working. What do you do when your prayers are not answered? You hold 
the stand of perseverance, of determination, of, of honoring your commitment to your commitment. You hold the, the vision that you're going to be all right. Keep your head up. Yes, even if you're going through foreclosure, as my mother said, keep your head up. Even if you're laid off from your job, keep your head up. Even if your marriage breaks up, keep your head up. Even if your children disappoint you and you said, this is not who I brought into this world, keep your head up. Even when it seems overwhelming, the adverse circumstances that you're in, and you say, God, you know, I know you know how much I can bear, but as Mother Teresa said, I wish you didn't have so much confidence in me. Keep your head up. That's my last message on the planet. If this is my last day, let the word go out that Les Ron said, keep your head up, keep your commitment to your commitment, and don't touch him for three days. Drop a microphone in his casket. If he doesn't grab it and say, you got to be hungry, he's out of here. And he's going on to his next assignment. <laughs> and I know I has a sweet potato pie waiting for me on the other end. I thank you for listening. Don't forget to share this and to, to like this page and share it to many people as possible. This is Mrs. Mamie Brown's baby boy. They got me all mocked up, ready for my procedure. They call it mapping. I'm going down there, and and I, I'm I'm believing. I'm coming back. And as Willie Jolly said, a setback is a setup for a comeback. I've been set up for a comeback, and I'm coming back stronger. Not stronger, but stronger than ever before. I got a training in April. I have mine in Fort Lauderdale that I'm going to be with my very good friend James Dentley in Chicago with Inspired to Speak. I'm going to speak everywhere that I possibly can until I drop. So whatever you hear that I'm coming to town, come, because I'm going to be a beast. <laughs> Let the record show. I'm coming out swinging, you know. In fact, they better watch out downstairs in the operating room because I'm going to be swinging, coming in, coming in there like Cool Hand Luke. That's my one of my favorite movies with Paul Newman, Cool Hand Luke. I'm going out swinging. Let the record show. Thank you so much. You have something special. You have greatness in you. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. I love you. As George Wallace would say, my very good friend, there's nothing you can do about it. So I want you to spread this word, like this page, and spread this word. Would you spread it and tell other people to spread it? That somebody needs to know when your prayers are unanswered, keep the faith and commit yourself to continue to work and to work and to work. Keep your commitment to patience and persistence and perseverance. And I can tell you based upon my experience, you will snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. Take no prisoners and eat the wounded. <laughs> oh, behave. Whatever. Take care. God bless.